In this episode of Kitchen Nightmares, Gordon Ramsay travels to South Bend, Indiana to dine at Jay Willie's, which is close to Notre Dame University. Rick, his wife Trisha, and their friend John William, aka Jay Willie, open the barbecue restaurant with high hopes. But Gordon finds that the restaurant is having trouble while John is in charge and Rick and Trisha are busy running a restaurant three hours away. Since Jay Willies has been struggling financially, We don't have a chef in the kitchen. I'm just here to, to serve what he wants me to serve and get it out as fast as possible. As a result, they have Steve working as the cook due to their inability to afford hiring a professional chef. I'm just hoping Gordon Ramsay isn't too hard on me because this type of food wasn't my idea. To break even, the restaurant must generate $22,000 in revenue per week. Rick and Trisha have cashed in their retirement savings as well as all of their remaining funds to invest it in Jay Willie's. Can Ramsay save the restaurant? Or was it too far gone to make a comeback? Everything's free. God bless Middle America. From the moment Gordon arrives at the restaurant, he notices signs of neglect, such as the faded, flashy neon sign out front. The restaurant inside, with its faded decor, appears untouched by time. So far, the first impression is not a good one for Chef Ramsay. He meets the owners, Rick, Trisha, and a visibly stressed John, and begins by assessing the menu. Though the unappealing photos on the menu do little to raise expectations, he orders a pizza, the famous ribs, and a pulled pork cheese boat. As he waits for his food, he notices that the atmosphere inside Jay Willie's is bleak and uninviting. The carpet, worn and dirty, seems to confirm Gordon's remark that it looks as if a thousand buffaloes walked over it. His first dish, the loaded baked potato pizza, arrives. To Gordon, it is the weirdest looking pizza he's ever seen. He's so freaked out by it that he asks a Catholic priest to bless his food, hoping for an improvement to what will come. The meal is disappointing. The pizza is soaked in ranch dressing that looks like wallpaper paste, according to the Michelin-starred chef. Hopefully the ribs are better. Sadly though, they are flavorless, topped with a generic barbecue sauce. The pulled pork sandwich is overwhelmed by processed cheese. Gordon intervenes to stop the priest at another table from trying the subpar pulled pork sandwich. You're not going to eat that, okay? okay. I don't want to go straight to hell. Oh man. Forgive me, they have sinned. Exploring the kitchen exposes the core issues, reliance on canned and frozen ingredients and widespread cost-cutting measures. The kitchen staff, without a professional chef, merely warm up pre-prepared dishes. Sitting down with the owners, Gordon's investigation reveals the dire financial situation, with John disclosing a staggering $1.2 million debt that risks losing the first and only home they've ever owned. Not only that, but he learns that Rick and Trisha would love to have a child, but can't have one due to their financial situation. In the kitchen, every pizza ingredient is sourced from either frozen stock or a container. John justifies the use of lower quality ingredients as a cost-cutting measure. Meals are quickly prepared and sent out, leading Gordon to compare the kitchen's operation to an assembly line due to the fast and repetitive food preparation. A majority of the dishes are returned by unsatisfied diners. Customers complain about the mushy food and cold ribs. Even though the place is packed that night due to Gordon's presence, many of them leave unsatisfied and hungry following their disappointing dinners. Following the dismal evening service, Gordon gathers the entire kitchen staff for a debrief. The team expresses their humiliation over the poor quality of service delivered. They discuss the increasing difficulty of working in the restaurant as their earnings continue to decrease. Rick attempts to pin the blame on John for the restaurant's failings, but the staff defends John, pointing out Rick's absence. Defensive, Rick argues that their living three and a half hours away necessitates his reliance on John for daily management. Gordon directs his frustration at the three owners, critiquing them for the restaurant's deplorable condition. He questions whether they should consider appointing a new manager to oversee operations. John expresses his desire to continue leading the restaurant, but acknowledges his need for assistance to improve his management skills and address the restaurant's challenges effectively. Post-meeting, Gordon takes a look at the walk-in refrigeration unit. He finds a refrigerator warm and discovers old potato skins, a container of rotting tomatoes and peppers, and meat trays stained with blood. 
Even though it is well past midnight, Gordon instructs Rick and John to trash all the spoiled food items and thoroughly clean the kitchen overnight as a demonstration of their commitment. The following day, Gordon arranges a meeting with the owners in a church to encourage a moral reckoning. Using the confessional, the owners commit to making the changes necessary to save their restaurant. John commits to improvement, while Trisha and Rick urge him to assume greater responsibility. They want John to be THE John Willie. Having thoroughly assessed the situation in the kitchen, Gordon initiates a comprehensive plan to revitalize the business. He gathers all the cooks in the kitchen and teaches them the process of crafting homemade barbecue sauce. Ramsey also introduces a new burger recipe using entirely fresh ingredients, planned for that evening's menu. As dinner guests begin to arrive, the kitchen busies itself with preparing the new burger offerings. The burgers are a hit with the customers. The difference in the energy of the dining area is a complete 180 from the prior evening as the food receives favorable reviews from the patrons, enhancing the evening's atmosphere. However, an hour into service, the volume of orders overwhelms the staff, and Steve, the cook, becomes flustered, leading to chaos in the kitchen. As things get rushed, some burgers are served undercooked or overcooked. Not only that, but soon they start to run out of ingredients to cook food with. A diner, upset over the poor quality of her anticipated burger, is moved to tears. Oh, you ran out of the fries? You ran out of the bun? Uh, have this is yeah. bad. No. The whole dinner is gone. Compromising on quality, the kitchen starts serving pre-made burgers on sourdough bread with frozen french fries. As the situation deteriorates, Gordon becomes furious over the compromised service standards. Meanwhile, guests are upset with the improvised solution to the burger and french fry shortage. Now I got two paper plates around some sort of big meatball. <laughs> How do you run out of potatoes? After another disastrous dinner service, Gordon pulls the entire staff aside for another debrief. Before implementing any further changes, Gordon seeks a commitment to change from the owners, who affirm their readiness. That night, Gordon's team performs a complete makeover on the restaurant to transform it from a dreary space into an inviting one. The changes begin with a big, beautiful J. Willie sign out front of the restaurant. Inside, there is also new wallpaper, new paint, and, much needed, new carpets. One wall has added a brick facade to provide some warmth to the dark interior space. Next up, Gordon has another surprise for them. He says every top barbecue joint has their own signature barbecue sauce. As such, he unveils a newly created J. Willie's sauce for customers to purchase as an additional revenue stream for the restaurant. More changes, though. In true Kitchen Nightmares fashion, Gordon has axed the 75-item menu, reducing it by half to concentrate on quality using fresh ingredients only. But the changes don't stop there. Realizing the place could use some help in the kitchen, Gordon has brought in help, but not just one chef, but rather four chefs to train and enhance the skills of the existing kitchen staff. One of them is Scott Libfried, Gordon's right-hand man who has made appearances with Ramsay before, notably in the Lido de Manhattan episode. He was also the blue team sous chef on the first 10 seasons of Hell's Kitchen USA. On the night of the relaunch, Gordon offers John words of encouragement before the service, which is fully booked. Even Rick is fully behind John, offering his own words of encouragement, using a local battle cry to rally him to succeed. Don't just do it for Chef, do it for the Gipper. <laughs> yes, the Gipper. There is a bit of local history there, with the Gipper reference some of you may have picked up on. Even though the relaunch night starts out optimistically, the kitchen struggles with the orders, mishandling simple dishes like potato skins, and even serving food on unclean plates. As the kitchen gets busier, John steps in to help manage customer expectations and the flow of orders during the wait. Frustrated by the prolonged wait, a customer confronts the kitchen staff about her two-hour delay before deciding to leave. Eventually, the kitchen manages to organize itself, getting it together to handle the orders and serving food once more. Despite initial setbacks, the relaunch proves to be successful, and the diners enthusiastically approve of the revamped menu. As Gordon departs South Bend, the prospects for Jay Willies are looking up for the first time in years, thanks to a renewed commitment to quality and a motivated staff ready to meet their potential. The episode concludes on an optimistic note, with the local community showing strong support for their updated neighborhood favorite. 
Jay Willies even won first prize at the College Football Hall of Fame Ribs Cook-Off with their signature barbecue sauce. In fact, the Jay Willies barbecue sauce was going to feature prominently in the post ramsey era of the restaurant. Indeed, the Suttons were determined to make Jay Willies work. They stayed in a local hotel for three months following the taping of the episode to work on the restaurant. They said it was so much work, it was almost like opening an entirely new restaurant. They also said that Ramsey's greatest gift was his help in creating Jay Willie's barbecue sauce, which they hoped to sell to the public as an additional stream of revenue. The Suttons also explained a little bit about their backstory in the same article. Rick had previously managed several of the Damon's barbecue chain of restaurants locations locally. After the owner passed away, he purchased two of them, keeping one as Damon's, that was the restaurant that was three hours away that they managed along with the second restaurant, which they brought John in to manage. This one they renamed in his honor to Jay Willies. Rick and Trisha knew John from before. He was a general manager at Damon's and had trained them previously. In the years leading up to this, they purchased a house on five acres of land. The two restaurants together cost almost $3 million. They cashed in everything they had, including their savings, retirement funds, personal assets, while borrowing substantial amounts from friends and family members to keep the restaurants afloat. Due to John's perceived mismanagement of the restaurant named after him, and at that point over leveraging both the cost of the two new restaurants as well as the mortgage on their house, they had no choice but to call in Chef Ramsey. After seeing the 1-800 number listed in the credits of Kitchen Nightmares episode, they decided to give it a shot. The Jay Willies episode of Kitchen Nightmares was originally scheduled to air on Fox on October 16th, 2008, but was pushed back due to the World Series going on at that time. It aired on October 30th, 2008 as the second season's sixth episode. Reviews post Kitchen Nightmares filming in 2008 were mixed. Some praised the new menu that focused on fresh, made from scratch dishes. The Jay Willies barbecue sauce continued to win praise. Some longtime customers rejected the new changes, including what they perceived to be higher prices post Ramsey's menu change. Although there's some who defended the reputation, such as this reviewer who didn't even know that Ramsey had done one of his makeovers there. They said all the ingredients were fresh and left quite satisfied, especially with the fall off the bone ribs. But by 2009, the fallout from the subprime mortgage crisis was in full swing with both the US economy but Indiana's economy in particular being hit hard. South Bend was on the decline prior to the Great Recession. When it hit, it further exacerbated an already bad situation. Unemployment in South Bend rose to 12.5% that year, more than doubling from the year prior. Even with Ramsey's help, it became apparent that it might not be enough to save Jay Willies. Rumors began circulating that Jay Willies might close. In an interview with a local newspaper, John said at that point Trisha and Rick wanted out, even being willing to close up, cut their losses, and walk away from the ownership of Jay Willies. John, on the other hand, was looking for an investor to bail out the restaurant to keep it going. On February the 4th, 2009, the restaurant was unable to carry on any longer and closed its doors for good. John posted on the Jay Willies website a final message to the customers, informing them due to the economy the restaurant was closing. John had the choice between cutting quality or closing down. He refused to compromise on the high quality of ingredients and service standards that define Jay Willie's. Ultimately, he decided to close the restaurant rather than compromise on its values. John remained grateful to Chef Ramsay for his help, acknowledging that despite their efforts, the challenging economic conditions ultimately led to the closure of Jay Willie's. While Jay Willie's restaurant may have closed, John kept alive the dream of the Jay Willie's barbecue sauce that was crafted by Chef Ramsay alive. He sought investors to distribute the sauce at retail locations across the country. Although in a follow-up article, John said he was having a difficult time finding investors due to the economy in Q1 and Q2 of 2009. Online, this episode stands out for a few reasons. For one, it may set a record for the most amount of people who cried in a single episode of Kitchen Nightmares with six people. All the owners, a staff member, and two customers cried. And that's with particular focus on the one lady who cried when her burger was served on sourdough bread after they ran out of buns. Others recognized the do it for the gipper expression that Rick used, referencing a motivational speech by Notre Dame's coach, Newt Rockney. 
Don't just do it for Chef, do it for the Gipper. <laughs> yes, the Gipper. The phrase, win one for the Gipper, holds significant historical meaning, especially locally and in American culture. It stems from the motivational speech by Notre Dame's coach, who invoked the dying wish of football star George Gipp. This rallying cry became widely recognized in American culture, especially after Ronald Reagan used it in his 1980 presidential campaign, having portrayed Gipp in the 1940 film Newt Rockney, All-American. In the Kitchen Nightmares episode, Rick uses the iconic phrase to inspire John and the team to revitalize their struggling restaurant, tapping into a storied tradition of overcoming adversity. After Jay Willie's closed its doors for good in 2009, the location became a brand of the Big B coffee chain. It lasted in the spot for six years, until 2015, when the building was ultimately demolished. It is unknown what happened to Trisha, Rick, John, or any of the staff who worked at Jay Willie's regarding their fate. It said in one of the news articles that their other restaurant, the chain of Damon's Grill, also closed in 2009. It certainly was a very tough time for the economy as a whole, in particular those who were overleveraged with property and debt. I hope that Rick and Trisha didn't lose their home and were able to recover post Jay Willie's.